So we started some of our thoughts, but let's, let's share some of our other thoughts from the video. You said it looks expensive. Why'd you say that? Normally when you see um, the amenities that they have, what they offer, mm -hmm. the, 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 the patient are pretty comfortable. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you're pretty much coming out of your pocket a little bit. All right, so she says it's pricey. Any other thoughts or observations from the video? Covered a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. They have a lot of different, um, I like the programs. They had different stuff for all age groups. Okay. You know, they have a, they service not just the elderly, but you know, those who need their services, whether they're younger group, older group, or in between. Right, and, and we talked about that earlier about keeping in mind that long-term care is not just for elderly. So right, they had things that appeal to everybody. Um, anything else? It seemed that the that facility is willing to go that extra mile like helping people out and their, or their patients, whether helping them get into the community, if they're able to move around just a little bit, help them move into an apartment where they can live independently but would still need the treatment. So uh, it looks like the, the employees and the staff were engaged and involved in, 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 help in the residents. Okay. Yes. Um, there was one particular word that I had just talked about. Did you hear it in the video? Um, they said in the video. Um, so what did you think that they meant when they said that? That they put um, the they patients put first. Patient first. Okay, yeah. They put the patients first. Um, and similar to what you said, they made sure that um, they provided things that were for everybody, mm -hmm. which means that they were aware of all the different types of patients that they had um, and what, what they needed to offer to them to make everybody feel comfortable. What about, um, they mentioned something else that we talked about um, prior to this class, um, continuum of care. Anybody hear that? Continuum, yes, I heard that one. They talked about how um, they tried to, they had the therapy and the psych, the psych and everything to try to create a continuum of care for their residents so that everything was working together, right? Um, so I thought that was a good example um, of continuum of care. And in everything that we saw in that video, you have a question? Well, basically, it, well, to that facility, I say that's like they're not sickly or elderly and they just put them there just to leave them. They still can continue on, you right. know, with, you know, daily duties that people, have activities people carry on with out in the world. Definitely. Now, most long-term places I've been, most of the people just sitting up in the day room watching TV. They're not active, yeah. they're not yeah. doing things. So yeah, this, this uh, particular facility, it looked like they did a good job of keeping everybody involved and active. And, and like I said, not just sitting there. Yeah. Um, um, and we all know that the more active we can keep the residents, the better their health will be. Um, so that's a good point. Um, and, but everything that we saw in the video, ultimately it ties back to quality of care. I wanna make sure that everybody understands that. Um, because similar to what he said, when we're moving, when we're active, when we have employees that are um, concerned and engaged, all of that contributes to the quality of care that that resident or that patient receives. Um, and so that's what we're going to be talking about today, um, is quality. Um, and so here are a few tools that we can use to evaluate quality because while we, we will have goals that will say we want to provide the highest level of quality, we have, we have to also have some type of way to measure what we're actually doing um, because we may find out that our quality level is not where we want it to be or where we thought it was. Um, so one of the first things we have to do is we have to have tools to measure the patient level of need. As we just talked about, every patient or resident is going to be different, going to have different needs. So we have to have something that can measure what that need is. What, um, you know, maybe Tanya's need is different from um, your need. And so we have to have something that can measure everybody's need within that facility. Um, some of the tools will be online. Um, there obviously will be steps that we have to take. If we find that there's an uh, area that's lacking, there will be steps that we have to take to improve that. Um, we can do a, a short survey to evaluate our tools and what we're doing. Um, and then, has anybody heard of Six Sigma? We talked about it a little bit in 110, but, but not a whole lot. Six Sigma is um, a method or process that you can use to improve your quality, improve your processes in your organization. Um, so dimming, we've also talked about dimming before. I'm just gonna quickly review. 
Um, he's basically the father of quality. Um, he did a lot of his work in Japan. Um, we also talked about the fact that Japan or the Japanese are really, really um, knowledgeable on, on quality and um, quality measures. It's something that they're really big on, um, which is why Toyota has done so well over the years. Um, so basically, uh, again, Deming is the father of quality. And he basically felt that uh, products and services, the only way that we're going to stay competitive in the market if we're a company or organization is if we provide products or services that have good quality. And so it pretty much makes sense. If you think about some of the, the places that you go, restaurants or, or products that you buy, um, those companies that have been popular and that have stayed um, successful over the years because they either have a product or a service that people want and that they're satisfied with so they keep coming back. Um, and that's pretty much what, what Deming was saying in a nutshell. And we can apply the same thing to the healthcare um, industry. Um, and, and there's, there's um, theories that Deming came up with that are used in all industries, not just healthcare, um, as it relates to quality. He also felt that total quality management has to be um, where we create a culture of quality. So I can't just have Leon or, or Bradley who um, are gonna go about quality and all the rest of us don't care. We have to create a culture where everybody is involved um, with the quality, which is kind of similar to what we saw in that video. It seemed like everybody um, that worked there was highly engaged and involved and motivated um, to, to working with the residents and helping the residents. And that's the kind of culture you have to create as it relates to quality if you really want things to change or improve. Um, does anybody know what evidence-based practice is? You'll hear it a lot as it relates to nursing. Um, but again, it can also be used in quality. And basically, what the evidence-based practice says is that um, care should be patient-centered. So again, just what we saw in the video where it talked about patient-centeredness. The same thing applies here where, where the evidence-based practice says that healthcare should be patient-centered, which you would think is a, a no-brainer or, or common sense, um, but you'll find that a lot of times organizations will get straight from what they're there to do. They'll get too concerned with you know, profits or competing interests, um, and they'll get led astray from what it sh should really be, which is patient-centered. Um, and so basically, we have to continue to find ways to improve our quality so that our day-to-day -day activities, our day-to-day -day, um, services that we provide incorporate that quality care, that patient-centeredness that we're supposed to have in our organization. Uh, structure, process, and outcomes. We've also talked about Donna Bedian before um, as we, we uh, explained and talked about quality. And basically, um, Donna Median was also an early theorist as it relates to quality. And basically, what he said was that quality involves structure, process, and outcomes. Um, so we'll start first to talk about the structure. What he meant when he said structure is basically the availability um, of our resources and the quality of our resources. So um, if we take the example of the video and you know, they wanted to incorporate all of these different um, activities, but they didn't have the weed, they didn't have the greenhouse. Do they have any structure? They have a plan, but do they have any structure? They don't have those resources, right? Without, you know, not having the weed and the greenhouse and, and the computers, there's no structure. That's their structure to build their on their plan to provide those services. So the first thing you have to have is a structure, which is the availability and quality of your resources. Um, this also includes your management systems, your guidelines. So again, if you have a plan to provide all these services, but you don't have a solid management team or solid management systems, you don't have any structure. So structure is number one. Um, then we have process. Process is basically where we measure what we're doing. So the process is what we're actually doing. Um, and, and whether that could be our delivery of our healthcare systems, that could be our implementation of those activities and services, like what we saw in the video. All of those things um, are lumped under our process. And they give an example here. An uh, example of a process measure is a proportion of, a, of diabetic patients 
who undergo their annual examination. So that is something that's being done. The annual examination is what's being done, um, and that's an example of something that we're measuring as it relates to process. So we talked about structure, we talked about process, and obviously the last one is outcomes. That was pretty self-explanatory, but we're gonna talk about it anyway. Basically, our outcome is what happened. So um, we, we put our structure in place, we had our processes, and then what happened? That's our outcome. Um, an example of the outcome measure might be patient death, right? Or patient satisfaction. Um, obviously, you will see from time to time patient satisfaction surveys. That's that organization's way of measuring their outcome. Or, or employee satisfaction or, or customer satisfaction. That's their way of measuring what the outcome was. Uh, so structure, process, and outcome. Um, Donna Bedian, that was the, the three things that he focused on. Um, so in essence, quality really has two measures, right? Uh, technical ex excellence, what do you guys think that is? Basically what it says. Um, at what level can you basically perform your job or your task? Uh, so it's the skill and competence of healthcare professionals and their ability of diagnostic or therapeutic equipment, procedures, and systems. So again, basically, at what level can you perform your job or your, or your duties or your skills? So that's technical excellence and patient perception. Everybody knows what that is, right? It's what we see. The key word here is perception because what we see may not be what it is or what happened. Um, or the patient percep perception may be completely different from our perception as a manager or as an employee of the organization. Um, and so what's key here that we have to remember is what? Subjective, which means that if you have 50 patients, you may have 50 patient perceptions. They could all be completely different because it's subjective. So that's based on how each person feels, their own personal opinion, um, their own personal lenses or their eyes on what they saw. Um, so you'll find that sometimes healthcare uh, professionals are not completely comfortable with measuring this one, number one, because it's subjective. So it's going to be hard to measure. Um, and so this one can create a little bit of discomfort. Um, but, but those are the two measures. So we have technical excellence and patient perception. So if we you know, are working in our organization and we've set up some goals as it relates to quality and, and things that we want to do, we will probably find that there's some places that we have room for improvement. So there's some opportunities for improvement. So um, typically <coughs> what happens is you know, the, it may not always be the president or the CEO, but, but <coughs> be someone from the management team that will basically implement uh, organizational-wide initiative. Um, so, for example, some of the initi initiatives that I have worked on or, or been a part of, one was, I told you guys about the patient falls. So that was one initiative where we um, tried to reduce the number of patient falls. One of the um, things we did, I told you about, was the socks. Um, some of the other things we did with the patient falls is that we would try to round more, so just basically checking in on patients more, just, even if it was just peeking in the room to see what they're doing to see. We might peek in and see someone trying to get up, so we'd go in and help them. Um, so, so that was an example of one initiative. Um, another initiative was hand washing, believe it or not. Um, it was an initiative that we needed to have because we found that not everybody was washing their hands. So, um, and, and you'd be surprised because um, they were all, not all, but most of them were, you know, uh, clinical mm -hmm. professionals that provide care. Wow. Um, so anyway, we had a, a, a hand washing initiative. So those are just uh, a few examples of different types of organizational wide initiatives that were formed by someone from the management team. Um, and usually who spearheads or monitors the initiatives are your quality improvement council or your quality improvement committee. Um, they will be the people that if someone has questions about the initiative that they'll go to them um, to get their questions answered. Because um, you'll have some people that say, why are we doing this? Or how long do we have to do this? Or, or how are you monitoring this? 
and the, the quality improvement team or council or committee were the ones that would answer those questions. And the committee is usually made up of different people from throughout the organization. Some will be clinical, so some will be nurses, some will be from the management um, area. Um, and so it's just the accommodation of people from different departments within the organization um, together to work on that initiative. Um, some of the things that the committee will do is that they will uh, open themselves up to feedback and suggestions from employees. So maybe we have these two initiatives, the falls and hand washing, but you may have someone that's working in the trenches every day that says, you know what, X, this is a, an issue as well. So can we add this to, you know, can we do an initiative for this? Or can, it, can this be something that we monitor and we measure? So a lot of times we would get good ideas from the people that were working on the floors that could see the things every day um, that were in need of improving or monitoring. So oftentimes they open themselves up to feedback um, and suggestions from employees. And then once they have all of the different areas that they need um, improvement in, they prioritize them. Which one of these is causing the most, you know, most danger to our patients? Or, or which one of these may cause us to get the biggest fine from our survey if they were to come and survey us? So they prioritize um, all the improvement initiatives to see which ones were of mo most importance or most urgent. Um, so you, you won't necessarily have 10 quality initiatives going on at the same time. You may just have two. And then once those two are done, then you'll do the next ones or, or, or however it may go. Or you may um, have some that are rolling and you'll do it and then you'll stop and then you'll pick it back up again. Um, so so the, again, the committee, they're the ones that usually prioritize the initiatives, figure out which ones we wanna do first, figure out what resources we need. So how many socks do we need to order to, to start that initiative? So they're the ones that uh, look at the resources and everything we need to get the project going. Um, and then last, they're kind of the cheerleaders. So the committee is the one that will publicize initiatives. They may go and um, teach department and speak about it during their lunch or, or something like that. Um, so, so they're also the cheerleaders for the initiative and they're the ones that kind of help create that culture and spread the word. This is what we're doing for the next two months. This is what I need you to do. This is why it's important. This is how it's gonna help our patients. So they're the ones um, that, that kind of spearhead the movement, um, if you might say. Um, some other roles of the committee include um, looking at patient satisfaction or customer satisfaction, <coughs> um, data, quality data, and performance data to make sure that we have the right priorities with our improvement efforts. Um, and then <coughs> they also, some of the teams may be cross-functional as we just talked about. Um, not everybody on that committee is going to be from the quality department. So you may <coughs> you may even have someone from the IT department, depending on what the initiative is. Um, and so a lot of times those teams are cross-functional. You have people from different departments. You may have people working on multiple initiatives at the same time on the committee. Um, and all of that is just to make sure that um, the improvements are getting done and that they're, again, creating that culture of quality within the organization. So here are a few steps that are involved in basically starting and doing a process improvement initiative. Number one, you need to form that committee or council, as they say, form a quality improvement council. Now, how does this uh, council get formed? A few different, way, different ways. Some may volunteer and say, I want to be on the council. You may have uh, no one volunteer. And if that's the case, they might get delegated to be put or put on the committee. Maybe the CEO has been watching Gold and says, you know, Gold's really good. I think the, the employees will listen to her. She's very smart. I want her to be on that committee. So sometimes you don't have a choice. Sometimes you may feel like you already have so much work to do, but this, if the CEO wants you to be on that committee, then you're going to be on that committee. Um, so so number, the number one step is to form the committee. Um, number two, form your, your teams. So again, to make sure you understand the difference, the council or, commi or committee is basically the ones overarching the initiatives. Now the teams may be on separate departments um, and they may be, for instance, if we take the um, patient falls example, um, the quality improvement teams 
will be the people on the in the departments working in teams to help to improve the initiative. Uh, so basically, the teams will ultimately report to the council or the committee, as I keep saying. Um, next, next step, establish the focus for each team. So again, each team is probably going to have a different goal or different projects that they're working on. And you don't want people, you don't want to duplicate efforts. So you want to make sure all the different teams are focused on whatever it is that they need to do. Um, number four, each team will look at their current situation and then analyze what the cause of the problems are. So again, if we stay with the same example, you know, we have a high number of falls. Um, what's causing the falls? Maybe it's the floor. Well, the, uh, fixing the floor may be really expensive right now. We can't do that, so what else can we do? Um, and then the, the ultimate decision would be socks. Um, so, so first, we look at the situation and analyze what the cause may be. Next, we act on the cause or causes and change, make the change, right? Um, number six, we analyze the changes. So how did the socks work? Were they successful? Were they not successful? Um, and then number seven, draw conclusions. If they are successful, maybe we need to order more or maybe we need to give it everybody. Maybe we just use two floors to test it out on. And so maybe if it was successful, we give everybody in the hospital a pair of socks when they get admitted or they get checked in. Or um, the socks didn't work. Let's not purchase any more socks. Let's go back to the drawing board and see what else we can do. Um, maybe we can um, do the floors one at a time. New, new floors instead of doing the whole hospital if we can't afford it. Um, so, so those are the steps you go through when you're trying to, to take on a process improvement um, initiative. Uh, <clears throat> you can use, anybody know what control charts are? Control charts? Nobody? Um, it's basically a tool that's used in quality to improve quality. Um, and basically it deals with variation. So you're measuring the variation over time. Um, and depending on what your result, results are, it will help you to identify if there's any defects or any change that needs to be made as it relates to uh, quality. Um, it deals a little bit with statistics. So I don't want to get too deep into it because everybody will fall asleep. <laughs> um, but, but here's an example of a control chart for your weight. So um, go back to 24 months or two years and record your weight every two weeks. So you'd have 24th month, 23rd month, 22nd month, all the way down to the first month, right? Once you have all that data, then you can build a control chart. And then you're able to measure whatever variations there were in your weight within those 24 months. So that's just an example of how you, and you can take the same type of control chart and apply it in a healthcare setting as it relates to quality. So maybe we do the same thing with, um, strokes or you know heart attacks or whatever you want to do we can do it with falls for, for 24 months we're going to measure the number of falls for every two weeks um and and so and that's how we would use our control chart to measure any variations um so why is that important why, why is mapping or or um analyzing um treatment important well that should be pretty self-explanatory right but why do you think it's important that we do the mapping, we use tools like control chart? More time? Yeah, and it's kind of similar to, to you know, what we do in class. Um, if we just say, well, I think there are that four people fell last week, uh, you know, as opposed to having that hardcore data or having something to support or back up what we're saying, um, that's why it's important. Because we can say, oh, I think it's improving, or I think two people fell last week compared to eight people two weeks ago. But if we have that chart that shows that we measured it, it's a lot more, um, you know, it's more data that we can stand on. It's more believable, right? Um, uh, so Six Sigma. We talked a little bit about it earlier. Uh, basically, again, come back to the Japanese. Um, it started uh, with Motorola, Six Sigma, 
Um, it eventually branched to other companies like Toyota, and now today many companies use Six Sigma. A lot of companies hire people specifically to do just Six Sigma in the organization. That's it. Um, so there's different, you know, certifications and things you can get to be certified as Six Sigma. But basically, it relates to doing things, as we talked about earlier, as efficiently as possible uh, with minimal errors or minimal defects. That's what. It, that's basically what it's related to. Um, let's see, <clears throat> there was a re a report that was written related to Six Sigma that basically talked about again efficiency and performance. Um, one of the more popular sayings um, that that relates to Six Sigma processes is to work smarter, not harder. Anybody heard that before? Mm -hmm. That's directly related to <coughs> Six Sigma and quality and how can you get the best results with the smallest amount of air um, or, or energy, um, you know. And so hospitals are now starting to incorporate Six Sigma more into their processes, especially since uh, we're getting less money now with our reimbursements, but we still have to provide the same services or, or sometimes more services now that our patients are sicker. So it's very important for us to be as efficient as possible and so they're using Six Sigma processes to try to make that happen. Um, is 99% good enough? This t ties into Six Sigma. So here's an example. Um, in our minds, we see 99% and we say, oh, you know, that's pretty good. But if we think of it in terms of here, if a surgeon removes 99% of the tumor, patient probably gonna die, right? Cancer they don't get it all, right? Or what about this one? If the anti antibiotic prescribed is 99% effective against the bacteria, the infection's not gonna go away, right? Um, one more, if a specimen labeling process is 99% effective, specimens will be mixed up at least 26 times per year. So in the grand scheme of things, is 99% good enough? Not, not in some situations, not in healthcare. And so what Six Sigma is saying is applying Six Sigma processes is to get you out of saying 99% is good enough. Six Sigma is saying you need to have it at 100%. It's basically what Six Sigma is saying. Um, and here it says 99% sounds great, but in actuality, it's only good if you're taking a test, right? Um, in medicine and healthcare, it's not good because that could be that could result that 99 percent could result in someone dying. Um, and so again, what Six Sigma says is we don't want 99 percent; we want zero errors. Um, and so applying Six Sigma processes helps to get you to 100 percent. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I think I have to stop here um, because if I keep going, then we're we're not going to finish. So we'll stop here about Six Sigma. We'll talk about quality on Thursday. Oh, no, no we won't, because we're going to our tour. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I'll see you guys Thursday, Thursday but not here. At 9.45. Yes, 9.45.